are in a study of the parables. And uh, as with the miracles, the, par the parables are a core part of uh, the communication of the value system of the kingdom of God, or the miracles in the parables teach spiritual values. Uh, the miracles are uh, very compassionate and very powerful in the lives of the individuals, but as we discussed, they are teaching tools. They are not universal. They are not, uh, they are not uh, eternal. Uh, the dead people die again. The, uh, the uh, demons can come back. All sorts, of, all sorts of existential realities associated with these. But they were, I don't, I don't mean to diminish the power and the wonder of the uh, miracle in the life of the uh, recipient, but uh, they, they were designed for a higher purpose, which was to teach that Jesus had power over demons and power over death and power over blindness and power to feed the multitude. And we went through all of these, uh, these miracles and their significance. And now we're into the parables and we've come out of uh, the mother load of parables, Matthew chapter 13. And we've read there how that Jesus explained the reason that he teaches in parables is that he kind of hides it from those that are not hungry. And those that are hungry, to them it is given. And those that have, have to those that have, more will be given and in abundance. And those that have not, even that that they have will be taken away. And it really is talking about their desire and their hunger, their aptitude for spiritual things. So now we're pretty deep into the parables and we've come out of Matthew 13 and we're down in Luke. We just visited the, uh, the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. And now we're gonna start in Luke 15 about lost things. And Jesus is answering a question. Why do you hang out with sinners and publicans or tax collectors? And Jesus tells a series of small parables to answer that question. So great to have you this morning. We're not studying with an individual or a specific family. This is a whosoever will study. And so we're glad that you're a part of this today. I hope that the word of God enriches your, uh, your day and your experience in God. Mighty God, we love you and we give you all the praise. We give you the thanks. We thank you for a beautiful spring morning. We pray that your hand of blessing and strength would be upon all of these that are joined in for the Bible study and help us, God, to gain an understanding and knowledge and wisdom. Help us to be effective in every ministry and in every good work. And we ask that you would do it in the name above every name, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All right, so chapter 15. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. He's hanging out <coughs> with sinners. And doesn't he know that stuff will get on you and you'll contaminate yourself. And we're, we're trying to all be very, very holy. And if we can stay very, very holy, then God will come back and kick the Romans out or ostensibly that's their, um, their company line. So Jesus is going to explain why he, the son of man, is spending time with sinners. And he spake this parable unto them saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the 90 and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. He's using practical, uh, familiar areas of discussion with them to introduce something that is uh, unknown to them or natural discussion to reveal to them spiritual values. So he's, he's engaging them. Which one of you would not go after the lost sheep? And when he found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. So now there's an element of joy in the finding of the lost sheep. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors saying unto them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep, which was lost. And so the joy is not his alone, but it's contagious and it's something that's shared. And so there's a focus of joy on the recovery of the sheep that has wandered off. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven. Now that is worth pausing for a moment and saying, what causes joy in heaven? 
Because here, once you come in contact with the word of God and the idea of God and his values, you want to know what, what is the value system of God and what uh, makes God happy, what causes joy in heaven. Well, this is a story that tells us that. Likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner. Ah, so it's not a sheep, not a lamb we're pursuing, but a sinner. And sinners then in this story are like lambs that wander off. Some sinners, some sinners <coughs> are like lambs that wander off. So this is a particular category of sinner who might have known God, might have been in the pen with the other 90 and nine, but just kind of saw a clump of grass and another and another and followed its nose and its appetite and suddenly found itself in the middle of the night and far from home and lost, okay? And people do that. People just, you could say innocently, although none of us are innocent, but you understand what I mean, uh, without... Uh, without evil intent, wander away from the things of God and then just wake up, I'm lost and I don't, and sheep are really dumb. Read a shepherd's account of Psalms 20, uh, Psalms 23. And <laughs> sheep, are, sheep are dumb animals and God likens us to sheep. It's not flattery. <laughs> he is, he's telling us we are like, <coughs> excuse me, like dumb sheep. Anyway, uh, but when he finds it, he rejoices and then he calls his friends and neighbors and there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 90 and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now this is uh, heavenly sarcasm, heavenly cynicism, a little backhand at the Pharisees because he's saying, I'm, I'm more excited about the one that wandered away and I found him than I am about the 99 just persons who need no repentance. Well, I'm gonna to suggest to you that the scripture says there's none righteous, no, not one. And he's talking to the Pharisees and he's letting them know if they have any sensitivity toward his language or toward the, the biblical uh, description of mankind that he's not saying, and you are just and righteous and you don't need repentance because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and everybody needs repentance. That's why he built it into the Lord's prayer. That's why John, chapter, uh, 1 John chapter one says that if we say we have no sin, we lie. The truth is not in us. And, uh, but if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. So God's all about repentance, but he's all, that, that comes with the responsibility of taking uh, ownership of your sin and a, and being honest with yourself and God and asking for forgiveness. So that's a little bit of a backhand toward the, uh, toward the Pharisees. Uh, 90 and nine just persons which need no repentance. I don't think there are 90 and nine that need no repentance. All right, so, uh, so the shepherd, the good shepherd, which is Jesus, pursues after the lost sheep. And this is a picture of his people, Israel, and it could be associated with the church if the church or if a church or if someone in the New Testament era uh, got into a, a frame of mind where they were like maintenance minded, maintenance oriented, focused on keeping everything pristine and, and you've got it just like you want it. Well, a sinner will mess that up. You know, a sinner, a sinner will mess up the church. And, uh, and so you, you, don't under, you don't even understand the conversation of why you would follow after sinners. Well, you've strayed, you've strayed far away from God like the sheep. And uh, you need to know what causes joy in heaven. All right. And so they're suspicious of what makes God happy. That's not good. All right. Verse eight, either, okay, another parable. What woman having 10 pieces of silver? Now there's only two women in the life of God. One is Israel and the other is the church. So, and like I say, these parables are in the gospel. So they're still under the canopy of the law, of the law of Moses. And uh, so this is a Jewish rabbi to a Jewish audience. So this in first instance is directed toward Israel. 
but it quite often can be generalized to uh, apply to the church. Uh, 10 pieces of silver. If she lose one piece, does not light a light, light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. Again, an engaging question. What woman would not light a light and sweep the house and search diligently until she finds it? So it's like, well, yeah, anybody would do that. And that answers the question, why are you spending time with sinners? Uh, and when she had found it, she calleth her neighbors and she calleth her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found the peace which I had lost. Now this is consistent. So in the first instance, we have Jesus, the good shepherd, and he goes and he finds the lamb and he is our example, he is our model. And so he goes to find the lamb. So we go to find the lamb. He has joy when he finds the lamb. We have joy when we find the lamb. He is aware of the impact that the lost lamb uh, being found has in heaven. It causes joy in heaven. And so we're aware that, the, that heaven rejoices. And so we want, we want heaven to be happy, believe me. We want heaven to be happy just generally, and we want heaven to be happy with us. And so here's something we can do. We can find a lost lamb, and that makes heaven happy. Well, that's a good thing. That's a day well spent, huh? So, um, so the woman, she seeks and she finds it and she finds it and she calls her neighbors and friends and she's rejoicing now. And so there's this parallel between the two parables and she's rejoicing. She found the peace which she had lost. Now, <laughs> so this is Israel or the church seeking after. Uh, so we're seeking after and you light the light and you sweep the house. Well, if we're talking about the church, we light the light, this little light of mine. You know, I'm, uh, so, so we lift up the word of God. At the entrance of thy word, there is light. And uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of the world. And so we lift up Jesus, and we lift up the light of the word of God, and it's preaching and it's prophecy and that's how you make the lights come on. Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered, brooded, moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. So the, the moving of the spirit, the prophetic word of God, light comes on. So it's the same today as it was in Genesis 1. You have the power to, to have a moving of the Spirit and speak the prophetic word and light comes on. So that's the light that we're lifting up, right? And so in the house, we have light. And in the house of the Egyptians, there's darkness. But in our house, there's light. And so you can, you can go to seed on this very obviously. So, uh, so we turn on the lights and then she breaks out the broom. What do you do with the broom? What do you, what do you sweep up with, with the broom? You sweep up trash, you sweep up dirt. She goes after the sin and that's conviction preaching and that's good teaching and that's, and that's application of the principles of the word of God in the house. And she's digging around in all the little nooks and crannies and she's getting underneath the pews and she's getting uh, down in the cracks with that broom. And, uh, and then she finds it. Uh, so when you, when you get to preaching about the, the good things of God and turn on the lights, and then you get to preaching about conviction and sin and naming sin and righteousness and holiness and you find the lost coin. Now, the sheep wandered off, just not paying attention, just wandered off innocently, right? The coin, the coin is in the house. The sheep is lost outside in the, will, in the wild. The, the coin is lost in the house. Well, how does that happen? Well, it happens like too many hours at work, too much going on, the sickness of a close loved one, uh, a personal setback, life hammering on you. And before you know it, you're not praying, you're not seeking, you're not uh, 
doing the things that are necessary to maintain a life, a life that is uh, alive in the kingdom of God. Because you, you've got to put out some effort. This is swimming, swimming upstream, this living for God business. And if you're just relaxed and you just kind of give up, you float downstream and you're gone. And before you know it, you'll be like a coin, cold and inanimate, dead and hard, which are all terms that we use to describe uh, a spiritual state of someone who's not alive in God, cold and dead and hard. And so, um, she finds it and she's excited and then her neighbors are excited. And likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. And so now it's very specific. The angels are excited and the angels are happy because what makes God happy makes the angels happy because they're totally invested in, in what, what makes God happy. So God is happy, heaven is happy, the angels are happy. The Pharisees, however, are not happy. Now that is a contradiction that cannot be tolerated in your life. If what makes God happy makes you sad or concerned or anxious or worried, uh, you really need some revival in your life, you know? The lady needs to take the broom and beat you with it. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so two lost things, one wanders away, one just kind of by the pressure of life, the erosion of life, the, uh, the, the dulling effect of life, uh, just kind of gets hard and dead. And then the lady finds it and uh, they have revival. Both of those are a picture of revival, by the way. And he said, verse 11, a certain man had two sons. And so, um, you know, now that we're deep into the parables, we're just freely making corollaries because we kind of know how. And, and, uh, and uh, the more we do this, the, the more that we understand what these principles are like. So the, the man has two sons and the man is God. Anytime you find a householder or a landowner or a father figure in the parables, it's mostly gonna be God, right? So he has two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Um, he asked for his inheritance up front. Well, that's, that's a little early. And most folks are not uh, willing to do that until they die. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey to a far country, and he was going to go see the world and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Now, there's a difference in this. The lamb wanders off, the coin uh, just kind of gets worn down. But this son has a plan and he says, I want all my stuff right now and he's, I'm leaving. I'm out of here, I'm gone to a far country and then he wastes his substance with riotous living. So he's a young man, so he's in the bars and he's hooking up with strange women and he's just doing what young men with a little money in their pocket do when they go away from God. But he goes willingly, willfully and purposefully. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And you just kind of have this uh, naivete about you. You just, you don't understand that when you get out in the world, you're gonna run out. You don't realize how good it is in the father's house. This is a picture of a backslider. The, the lamb is, the coin is, and, but this is a backslider that sit, looks around and makes a determination and says, I'm leaving. And then there's a famine in the land and he's in want. Because when you leave the father's house, all the good things you have in the father's house don't sustain because they originate and the flow and the origin is in the father's house. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his field to feed swine. Now this is a Jewish rabbi teaching a Jewish audience and to go and be around hogs or feed hogs is like, okay, this is symbolic of the lowest place where you can go uh, in our culture or in, in our society. And it's a horrible thing to contemplate. 
and he would have he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He was wanting the pig food. Now, unless you've really been around pigs and fed pigs, uh, you really don't know how how grotesque that is uh, to contemplate. But when you get hungry enough, anything, anything looks good. And nobody's helping him and nobody's taking care of him. And when he came to himself, now this is the low point of the story and this is the place where the story begins to swing back. The pendulum swings down and then it's swinging back up. And so this is the place where the story begins to a sin. He is backsliding. He's leaving the father's house. He's going low, low. He's like the um, he's like the man in the story of the Good Samaritan. He's leaving Jerusalem on his way down to Jericho, and he gets mugged and left on the roadside, half dead. And so that's where the son is. And now he comes to himself, and then he says, when he comes to himself. How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with them? He remembers the father's house. He says, this stinks, literally. This is awful. Here I am fellowshipping with pigs. I'm far from the father's house. And I know, I know servants in my father's house that are living a pretty good life. And so I'll, I'll arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned before thee or against the heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called, worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Okay, so he is truly contrite. He's repentant and he felt some kind of special status before, some kind of cockiness and just this unrealistic picture of who he was in the world because who you are in the father's house doesn't necessarily, necessarily translate to who you're gonna be out in the world. You know, your daddy loves you. And so you think you're really special. <laughs> but the world doesn't care about all that, nor about you. And so he says, I'll just go be a servant. So what you're, what you're witnessing here is repentance and humility. He's humbling himself and he has a contrite heart. And, uh, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, the father saw him a long way off. That indicates to me the father's been watching for this boy. Every day, perhaps several times a day, he's looking way down that long road that leads up to the father's house. And he's thinking one day, one day, one day, I'm going to see my boy. He's coming back and he's ready for it. He's got a cow, a fatted calf. <laughs> and so this is a calf that you keep tied up in the stall and you feed him a lot so he gets real fat so that when you slaughter him for the party, uh, it's a really, really good uh, piece of meat, you know? So uh, the father is ready and when he comes back, the father is responsive and the father is open and he doesn't care that he smells like a hog. He falls on him, he hugs him, he kisses him and, uh, and he's obviously overjoyed. It's the joy that was in the first parable about the lamb. It's the joy in heaven and the rejoicing over having found the lamb. It's the joy in the woman's house over having found the coin. It's the same type of joy. But in this case, the father didn't go find the son. The father waited for the son to come to himself because this is a different type of backslider. When people leave by will and by volition and they leave the house of God, the kingdom of God, you don't go after them. You'll follow a lamb that's just wandered off innocently. You'll look for the backslider in the house that's just kind of worn down and calloused and cold. But you don't go down to the pig pen and try to entreat or logically convince or emotionally uh, uh, transform some person that's in the pig pen. You'll just come back smelling like a pig and you won't do any good until he comes to himself. And when he comes to himself, then the church or the father runs to meet them and embraces them and brings them back. Now, 
And those are, there's a dynamic difference between these three parables and that, that is it. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And that may well be true. Uh, and it's a good expression of his contrition and his humility. But the father said to the servants, he won't even talk about it because when you're a son, you cannot just be a servant. You can't quit being a son because you're a son by birth. Okay, so um, the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. I'm going to change. And this is indicative of the robe. The garment is always a symbol of righteousness. Or in this case, what he has on is a symbol of sin. It check uh, Zechariah chapter three. Uh, Joshua has on a filthy robe. God gives him a clean robe. That's indicative of sin. And then the impartation of righteousness. So they're going to change his robe and give him status as righteous, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and this is not just ornamentation. This is the uh, signet ring. This is the seal in wax and on the letter or on the document of the, uh, of the authority of the house. And so now he's given, he's restored him to righteousness. He's restored him to, uh, to authority and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. So he says, we're gonna have a party. We're gonna have a party because my son has come home. So when backsliders come back, when sinners come back to God, we have a party. So church should look and sound and seem like a party and kill the fatted calf. Everybody's happy except the fatted calf and kill it and let's eat and be merry. <clears throat> this is my son that was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found and they began to be merry. And it doesn't matter where you're from, what your background is, <clears throat> but you can be absolutely Protestant in your orientation. But these words mean something. This is my son that was dead and he is alive. That means that somewhere from the father's house down to the pig pen, don't know where the tripwire was, could have been on the front porch, could have been 10 days into the journey. I don't know, but he was alive when he was in the father's house. He was dead when he was in the pig pen, and now he's alive again. What does that mean? It means if you die in the pig pen, you break hell wide open. You go to hell if you die in the pig pen. This parable tells you there is no such thing as eternal security or once saved, always saved. That is a band-aid on the erroneous theology of just faith and not works. But it matters what you do. And the door swings both ways. Read Ezekiel 18. And you can come to God and you can leave God. And before you come to God, you're lost. And when you come to God, you're saved. And when you leave God somewhere along the line, you'll be lost again. That's what this parable says. He was lost and he was dead. And I don't care what background you, you're from. Those are words that are used for people that are outside the covenant of God. The lost and the saved. The dead and the living. And it doesn't get any more, it doesn't get any simpler than this and and he was dead and he's alive again he was lost and he's found and they began to be merry okay so they're having a party now his elder son was in the field now this is a not so subtle uh jab at the pharisees and so he's going to now uh portray the elder son as the pharisees that ask him the questions that started these parables because they are so righteous and so holy and, and they are so maintenance oriented and they've lost sight of the vision and the mission of God, which is to seek and to save that which was lost. Now his elder son was in the field and he came and he's working for the father. As he came, he drew nigh to the house and he heard music and dancing. Well, that's a picture of Sunday night at church. It's music and it's dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. This is a bad sign that you're a son of God or a servant of God and you don't know about music and dancing. You need to know about that. 
Because if you don't know about music and dancing in the house of God, that means you're a sourpuss like the Pharisees. Okay. All right. All right. Just an Amber Alert. I was reading a, <laughs> an Amber Alert. Uh, it's really neat that you can get the car, the license tag, and everything, uh, and then everybody on the, on the highway knows about it. That's great. God help them find that baby. And, um, and he called to one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed a fatted calf, and because he has received him safe and sound. And the servant's like, yay, this is wonderful. But he's getting the impression that the brother doesn't think this is so wonderful. So he's kind of mm, tempering his, uh, his delivery there. And, and he was angry. His brother came home and he's angry. His brother is not in the pig pen anymore. And he's angry. His brother was who knows where in a ditch dead somewhere, but now he's back and he's alive. And he's angry. He's angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and entreated him because God reaches for everybody, even a self-righteous, ingrown, fruitless Pharisee. His father came out to him. God reaches for everybody. And he answering said to his father, lo, these many years do I serve thee and neither transgress thy any time thy commandment, I've been faithful and I'm holy and I'm righteous and I'm good. And yet thou never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. He's jealous. He's jealous. And so when the party starts and when people begin to celebrate new converts and we do, the church does, the church is excited. Look, the lamb is found. Oh, the coin is found. Praise God. Oh, look, the son has come home. Kill the fatted calf. And let's, uh, <laughs> and let's have a party. And, uh, and, uh, and the old brother, he's not having any of it. He's, he doesn't buy into it. He's not excited. He's happy. He's looking down his judgmental nose and he's saying, well, I don't know how long that's going to last. Well, I don't know why they're making such a celebration over these new converts, over this, over this little family that just came in and got baptized. I don't know why, because, you know, they never sit around and applaud and, and, and I'm not getting the attention. And so it can't be good if I'm not getting the attention. And uh, that's a serious spiritual disease that's happening in this boy. And, uh, if you look around a little, you can find that. And it's an ugly thing when you do. But a church culture, if it's gonna be God's culture, it has to be really excited about people coming back. And if the church culture is healthy, you have an understanding in the body and, and you don't have that old, that old appraising, evaluating, uh, expecting uh, bad outcomes, not, not excited because they're not walking in the door holy and they're not walking in the door uh, showing the fruit of their, uh, of, of, of a 30 year experience in God. You just, you have to wait. It's like having little kids. Little kids, it's a great, it's a great analogy. Little kids make you happy. And they're a mess. I mean, they, they, they're messing diapers and they're puking everywhere and they're full of spit up and they drool on everything and, and they're constantly in need and just little, peop little people uh, take a lot of attention and new saints in the kingdom of God take a lot of attention. But for some reason, I mean, even though they can't produce anything, they're just, they just reduce you to, uh, to uh, lunacy and you're playing peep eye with them and you're, and, you're, and you're making faces with them and things you would never do. It reduces you down to this infantile response level and, and you're, just, you're just 
being all nutty. You wouldn't, you never act like that at work or among your peers or anything else. But that baby, that baby just brings it out of you. Well, that's how it is in the kingdom of God. The freshness, the newness, the life that comes in, the party, the, and a revival church has to have that attitude. And if you have that old ingrown, pharisaical, uh, uh, you value the holiness standards more than you value the fact that the holiness standards was, were given to you to, to uh, help you sustain the life of the new ones that come in and sustain your life. And, 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 and so anyway, this older brother is the Pharisees that asked the question. And you didn't give me a kid <laughs> that I might rejoice with my friends. Well, you could have had a party anytime, Jack, but you just, you're just too dull to have a party. And if you'd have been having a party, people would have come, sinners would have come. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots and has killed him, uh, and kill for him, you've killed for him the fatted cat. You want to talk about all his mistakes and all of his failures. But when he comes back in, it gets under the blood. And you don't bring that up anymore. He, we're all sinners. You included, righteous Jack. You included. And so um, this thy son, he's been devouring your living with harlots and now you've killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, son, you are ever with me and all that I have is thine. It was meat, it was fitting that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive and was lost and is found. So the father sticks to the guns. He's not moved by the, uh, by the uh, hardness of his uh, elder son but he just lets him know this is, we were right, this is right, and, and implicit in this is, and we'll do it again for anybody else that comes in, and this is how the church, this is the attitude of the church, and this is the attitude of anybody. We are interested in what makes heaven happy, we are interested in what makes God happy, because that is a sinner coming back, then we are heavily invested in sinners coming back to God, and when they come back, we have a party and we celebrate and we restore them. And we don't look at them with skeptical eyes because of what they've done and where they've been and all of those things. All right, so these are parables and parables are illustrative to us of the conditions or the dynamics or the principles, the value system of God and the kingdom of God. And most of them start with the kingdom is like, or, and then he gets into, well, there was a certain man. So, okay, so um, now we could, we could pursue parables in uh, other of the gospels, but since we've already started in Matthew and we've kind of run our course with uh, Matthew 13, we're gonna go back to Matthew and we're gonna finish out the parables in Matthew. And uh, most of them are redundant in other of the gospels. Uh, we did wanna go and, and get the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son because those are just, uh, those are just indispensable parables. And so we needed, to, uh, we needed to go to those. All right, so um, let's, Let's go to, um, let's go to uh, chapter 18 in Matthew. And we're going to, um, we're gonna start in verse 21. And this is a parable about forgiveness. All right, Matthew 18, 21. Uh, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft or often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? I mean, there's gotta be a limit, right? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And the cynic in the crowd said, boy, that's a lot, but okay, 490 times, and then it's on. Uh, but you understand what Jesus is saying. He just says, the mercies of the Lord endure 
forever. That's a mantra from David. Let Israel now say, the mercies of the Lord endure forever. And now let Judah say, the mercies of the Lord. And so the idea here is that God's mercies are everlasting. If you can make your way back, God will receive you. All right. And that's the caveat, if you can make your way back. Because you can get out there and you can, as we studied with Esau, you can corrupt your heart and harden your heart to the place that you might seek a place of repentance carefully with tears, but are not, you're not able to find it. That, that can happen, that has happened, that is happening right now to someone. So Jesus tells him a story about forgiveness. Therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants? All right, so now we're into this. The king is Jesus and the servants, well, they're the servants of God. <laughs> and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed 10,000 talents. Now that's 10,000 pieces of silver and it is a fortune in any time, their time 2,000 years ago or our time. But for as much as he had not to pay his Lord, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children. And this is all, this is all under the law of Moses, another example of, of the fact that the gospels are still under the law of Moses and all that he had and payment to be made. And while we're on that, let me just say that it was for seven years and you had to pay your debts. That's personal responsibility. And it gave you a means by which to pay your debt, which is honorable and responsible. And at the end of the seven years, um, all debts were forgiven and servants or slaves were set free. And hopefully, it, this is kind of a benevolent slavery, hopefully you learned enough in the house, you went to school for whatever part, the seven years was on a clock. And so if, you, if he goes into this at year four, he's only got three years of slavery. And if he goes into it at year six, he's only got a year of slavery. So that's the way it worked. That's the way the, the, uh, the structure was established in the law of Moses. Uh, for this gentleman, we don't get an indication of how long it was going to be other than uh, <clears throat> all he had and payment to be made. So he's, he's in there and now he and his whole family are uh, enslaved. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And uh, so he's, he's asking for mercy. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. And so it was gonna happen at year seven, but the guy just forgave the debt. And I mean, it was a fortune, 10,000 talents. The same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, which is exactly what it sounds like, a tiny little amount of money. And he laid his hands on him, took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. Just about what he said to his master, but he would not. And he went and cast him into prison till he should pay his debt which is something I don't understand how you, if you're in prison, how you pay your debt. Uh, so when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desired me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant? even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So this is a story that is expressed in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five. Blessed are the mercifuls, for they shall obtain mercy. It's just as simple as that. This is the reciprocal principle or the dynamic of the kingdom of God. Give 
and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will I cause men to give into your bosom. Uh, have mercy, and you'll get mercy. Give love, and you'll get love. Uh, here, give forgiveness, and you'll get forgiveness. And that's the reciprocal nature of the kingdom of God. You get what you give in the kingdom of God. So your forgiveness that you have once you have, um, once you have um, come to God and you've asked for forgiveness and God washed you clean of your sins and then you go out and you are hard and unforgiving to others, God will rescind your forgiveness. Now, this, I can't help it. I just have to tell you, this is another glaring instance of evidence that you might be forgiven, but you can lose your forgiveness. You might be saved, but you can lose your salvation. And uh, that is what this story indicates, unless you believe in purgatory and, uh, and uh, that this story is, well, he's going to, put him in a place of torment for a little while till he gets it all straightened out. And so, uh, but I don't, I don't find purgatory in the, in the scripture. So at any rate, uh, the dynamic is the reciprocal principle in the kingdom and forgiveness is uh, at a premium in the kingdom of God. And so God forgives, so we forgive. And vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So even if it's a horrible, grievous thing, you give it to God and let God take care of it. And if you're worried about God's capacity to take care of your adversary or your enemies, read the last half of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Believe me, what God does to them, <laughs> you don't even hold a candle to it. Uh, God is a much better person at vengeance. Um, but you have to watch that old spirit of vengeance and bitterness and revenge it gets down in you, it'll eat you alive. So, okay, so it's a story about forgiveness. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's a place of forgiveness. That's what the people of God are like. That was a Jewish prophet to, or a rabbi to a Jewish audience, but it is generalized beautifully to the church. And so the church collectively should be a place where mercy and forgiveness flows and grudges and vendettas and vengeance and bitterness are not part of the daily bread. All right, uh, chapter 20 and beginning with verse one. For the kingdom of heaven is like, and here it is again, unto a man that is a householder. So again, the authority or the householder or the property owner or the father, it's, it's Jesus, all right? which went out early in the morning to hire laborers in his vineyard. So God's always going out looking for people that'll come work in his vineyard. Well, what's his vineyard? Well, he's trying to save the world and he wants to, uh, his church is his cultivated field or his church is his vineyard and he wants to bring forth uh, good fruit. And that would be other people, more people in the kingdom of God. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And uh, so they're going to be there. They're going to work all day and they're going to get a penny. And he went out about the third hour. like So he went out around daylight. And now this is nine o'clock in the morning, third hour. And he went out at about nine o'clock and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, go ye into the vineyard and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour. So he went out at noon and three in the afternoon and did likewise. He's still hiring people. He's got, he's got lots of work and he's got, uh, he, he's, he said it to his disciples. He said, look on the fields, they are white already to harvest. He said, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. One of your daily prayers should be, Lord, send forth laborers into your harvest. And uh, he's hiring, he's, he's looking. And, and that's part of the conversion redemptive process. As soon as God gets you in the kingdom, he begins to groom you for production. And he gives you... Uh, he gives you the mission. It comes with the calling of God. Everybody has it, the, the need to reproduce in the kingdom of God. 
And, um, and so again, like the parable of the lost things, the parables of the lost things, there's joy in heaven. And so we're, now we're mixing these metaphors, but it doesn't matter because the Eastern mind here, they don't mind mixing metaphors at all. And uh, so anyway, he's hiring people. And then about the 11th hour, he goes out and finds others standing idle. So that's five o'clock in the afternoon. There's hardly any daylight left. And says unto them, why stand you here all the day idle? And they say, because no man has hired us. And he say unto them, he saith unto them, go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. So God is just hiring all day long, all the long day of man's journey on the earth, all the long day of this thing that we call time. God is hiring right down to the 11th hour and God is about to come. He's about to return to the earth. So when he was, when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last to the first. And when they came and were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny, which is, this is great because the guys that worked all day, that was what they contracted for. And, and so they got a penny. So this is a magnanimous uh, uh, gesture by the, by the landlord, by the householder. And when the first, those that were hired at daylight, when they came, they supposed that they should have received more. And likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, these last have brought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. We've been here, we've been working, we've been suffering, we've, we've, we've sweated, and we've, and we've been here during the heat. I mean, the, the, they came when the sun was going down. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? That was our contract. That's what we agreed on. That uh, take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto uh, this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye, thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many shall be called but few chosen. Now, so what is this? <clears throat> well, this is salvation. And this is, if you get in early and you have a long journey, penny a day. If you get in late, just under the wire, penny a day. Everybody gets the same salvation. Heaven is going to be heaven. It's not tiered. It's not better and worse neighborhoods. It is, it is everybody gets a penny a day. And, uh, that is a wonderful, wonderful system. And, um, but here they are injecting into this their human ego and their pride and the pernicious nature of people to compare themselves among themselves. And when you find yourself or somebody else comparing yourself among yourselves, you're trying to find place in a hierarchical su structure in a social structure, if you would. You're trying to find your place there. And what you want is you want a place that's higher than other people. So you always compare yourself with other people trying to find folks that aren't as good or as productive or as effective as you. So you can feel better about that. And you look at people that are more of all of these things and they become like a, a goal or an ideal or something like that. But quite often, um, that's what's at work here. But Jesus doesn't operate that way. Everybody gets the same. And if you have the heart of God, you're glad if you started at six in the morning, you're glad for all of those that came in the afternoon and you're like, wow, great, more people are coming in. This is wonderful. You're not thinking, well, man, I should have waited till the end of the day and I would have got a penny. Or you're not thinking, well, they don't really deserve as much as I get because I've been here, I've been working long. And, um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful system that God has created. 
And it's a system that if you are in league with God and love the lost and love new people coming into the kingdom of God, you're excited about these things and you don't care the conditions and you don't compare them with yourself. You just simply say, I'm glad I was here to help create the, the climate and the construct for them to have a place to come in. I'm glad that I was here to have the lights on. I'm glad that I was here and, and I was privileged to participate in the building of this. Let there be children, let there be many that come afterwards and let them have a better experience than, than I've had. Um, and with this parable, I always tell the story of Tim Green, who came in at 26 years of age on a Friday night and got the Holy Ghost and got baptized. He came back to church on a Sunday morning. He attended his first apostolic service, Sunday morning service on Sunday morning. Didn't come back Sunday night. Monday morning, slipped on a piece of ice going into work, whacked his head on a concrete floor, never regained consciousness and went to meet God 26 years of age, but uh, three days old in the kingdom of God. Never had to learn anything, never had to fast, <laughs> never had to give up much because he just didn't know what to give up. Never had to suffer, never suffered persecution. <laughs> he came in at the 11th hour and went right into heaven. <laughs> and it's a little irritating, but in a good natured kind of way. But uh, you wanna be on God's side of all of these things. All right, well, we're gonna stop. We're gonna take about a five minute break and we'll start again at nine with uh, some more parables. All right, so good to be with you this morning. Lord God, we praise you and thank you. Thank you so much for the day, for your goodness, for the word of God. We praise you for it all. We pray your hand of blessing on all these that are listening in. And God, we just pray you would anoint and bless your people to have a day full of good things and that their lives would prosper in every way. And we ask it in the name above every name, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. All right, see you in a little.